So uh, the topic uh, uh, Chandra has sent to me was the providing food safety through post-harvest storage and handling. So I would try to take you through what uh, is involved in the post-harvest uh, uh, handling of grains and how it would contribute to the food security. As you can see from my introduction, I work as a grain storage researcher, so I probably have a bias more towards the grain storage and why it is so important for the, uh, for the world. Um, so I thought to start with uh, maybe we should look at the definition of the food security and this was agreed by uh, World Food Summit in 1996 uh, organized by the Food and Agriculture Organization. So the definition says the food security exists when all people at all times have physical or economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active healthy life. So if you take that definition and look at it from a grain storage uh, researcher's perspective, so what does that really mean? So sufficiency means that we have to have enough production uh, globally, uh, but also store it safely. And because if we don't store safely, it would be uh, spoiled and it's not usable to, for the human need. Uh, safe and nutritious, uh, nutritious, that phrase basically implies that we have to have a better preservation of the quality uh, uh, prior to consumption, uh, otherwise uh, 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 the food you, would, would not be consumed and sometimes the grain could be spoiled to the level that it can't be even used as animal feed. Uh, so the food preservation or the preserving that becomes very important and that requires drying and storage practices and that's what I would elaborate a little bit more. Food preferences uh, basically is referring to the processing of the food so that we produce different types of fruits also meet the needs of the consumers. Uh, but the one thing to keep in mind, you cannot produce a high quality food product from a poor quality raw material. So again, the importance of the storage and preserving that quality becomes very important for making that happen. Uh, physical access certainly is the distribution uh, uh, of the food uh, produced because the food is not consumed at the place where it is produced. And then in that scenario, what that means is that, again, we have to minimize the losses uh, during the handling and transportation uh, when the food is distributed. And economic access certainly talks about the purchasing power of the uh, individuals, but also nations uh, when the food is uh, distributed across the international boundaries. And that purchasing power then comes through the jobs uh, in the production. Uh, again, from an agricultural perspective, there are many, many jobs in the production, processing, uh, and preservation, so uh, all of those then contribute to the economic access, and, but also the jobs come from other uh, sector, uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, so why is the food security critical? Is the, as uh, there are many predictions, uh, and this is the one from the, again, uh, from the uh, world, uh, uh, or UN, UN uh, organizations, which is predicting the population, global population to be reaching uh, from about, uh, the, from the, almost reaching about uh, 9 billion by 2030, and then uh, towards the uh, end of the century, reaching to almost uh, uh, 11, 11 billion people, or 10 and a half, 10.6 billion people. Uh, that means we have to increase the food production and, and also increase the storage technologies to feed that many more people. Like if the, uh, if nothing was done uh, to, uh, to feed that many people, we would have to have at least 1.5 times more food quantity uh, of the current, uh, current level. Uh, so approach we have taken, and when I say we, the society has taken, and then the research community has taken. Uh, we have, we have uh, taken the approach that as the population grows, we have tried to feed that growing population by increasing the, uh, the production. So we have uh, taken the approach of producing more. Uh, as you can see that product, more production then require increased inputs uh, and also require in, uh, increase in the cultivated land. And that has had uh, negative environmental impacts uh, in, the, in terms of the deforestation because cultivated land is only so much land. And to bring more land into cultivation, you, uh, have, uh, we have done a lot of deforestation. Uh, and also, we have we then used a lot of uh, fuel, chemicals, water to produce that food. Uh, 
So looking at uh, what the grain storage losses right now, uh, in a well-managed system, the losses would be less than 1%. And to, in my view, we have the current technology, current know-how, the knowledge, that all food being produced could be stored uh, in a proper way and then reduce those losses to less than 1%. Unfortunately, in a poorly managed system, the losses uh, can be up to 50%. And in an individual warehouse or individual storage structure, 100% grain can be lost. And I have witnessed this in the not in the past, in the last, say, four or five years when the farmer would give me a call and say and they are having some storage issue and I have visited the farm bin where a whole bin has a spoiled. Uh, and a spoiled uh, to mean that the grain is a free flowing, it's a free flowing uh, material, but it has a spoiled to the level that it has caked and uh, the only way you can take out that grain out of the bin is using front end loader uh, or using the almost uh, 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 like uh, uh, using the shovels, hand shovels, to break those, uh, that caking which has occurred in the bin. So that level of spoilage it still happens. Uh, and uh, so it can be 100% in an individual system, but as a system as a whole, in the poorly managed system, 50% loss. And there are countries who still lose 50% of the produced food. There was a FAO study done uh, globally, and that uh, applies to all nations, uh, nations the 30%, their estimate, were, estimate was 30% of the food never makes to the consumer, or for, food spoilage is 30%. So you can imagine that if we want to grow our population by 30%, we can feed that population without producing more food just by preserving what we have produced. So it's a very, very critical uh, uh, need for having better storage and preservation systems. So to give you an example of, let's say a country uh, requires 100 million to feed its population. And in that scenario, if they lose 50%, they only have basically 50 million tons. So there are options. Their options are either they produce more uh, and to lose more, uh, or they uh, import the grain. Uh, so the, the amount of money needed to import that grain to feed their own population is quite significant in that scenario. So the first option is that they produce 200 million and they lose uh, 100 million of that, so they feed, so they can meet their requirement to feed their nation. On the other hand, if they manage that grain properly and they have no loss, they can still feed their population without producing more. Uh, and uh, the nation has to start thinking along those lines. And the reason I said the nation has to start thinking is like right now, the system is structured in a way that the farmer uh, so when the farmer is con in control of the grain, and that's where the losses are occurring, that those losses are borne by the farmer. It is not seen as a national loss until it becomes a situation that the uh, grain is not available for food and they are importing as a nation. And uh, if you do uh, what I would call the payback period, if they took one years of the money they are bring spending on importing the grains, and they spend that much money in building the infrastructure which farmers can use because many farmers in the small land holding do not have the resources to build the right infrastructure. If the nation build that infrastructure, they don't have to then keep importing that grain year after year. Uh, so it has to take a different approach uh, from a nation's perspective uh, because right now all that burden is on the farmer uh, with a small land holding. Uh, so to preserve the grain, then we need to understand what is happening and why the grain is spoiling or what causes the spoilage. So in 1935, uh, uh, Tens uh, lead, defined the term ecosystem first time. And basically what uh, he defined the term was that when you have a biotic and abiotic or the biological variables and the physical variables are happening at the same time and are being considered together as a whole, and that Understanding in that scenario, understanding that scenario, you can then take corrective actions in a, in a, in a right way. And then, then later on, in, in 1989, Odom defined the term ecosystem for journal use as the biotic community uh, and its non-living environment treated together uh, as a functional system of complementary relationships, but including the transfer and circulation of the energy and material. Uh, why I'm uh, giving these definitions is because when you look at the 
uh, ecosystem then, they really are open systems. That means the grain, so like for example, if you have a grain bin or grain silo, you take the grain out to feed the, for use, uh, to feed the people or the animals, for example. So the material is flowing out of it. Certainly the energy flows across it, so because of solar radiation, for example, or if the outside temperature is cooler or warmer, it would affect that uh, storage structure. So both energy and materials are moving, so that's happening in an ecosystem. And also in the ecological succession uh, or replacement of one kind of animal community is happening uh, in, the, in the system. Uh, so like in grain bin, for example, microflora could be predominant at one time, or, and other time insects could be present. Uh, if you design properly, certain vertebrates could be present, so like birds and rodents uh, could have an effect on the qual uh, stories. So in a sense then, what is stored grain ecosystem is a man-made ecosystem. Like those systems, the definition applies to the, any biological, physical environment system. Uh, but a stored grain ecosystem then is a man-made ecosystem, and that means uh, the, we should be able to take care of that ecosystem and manage that ecosystem. Uh, in which deterioration of the stored products results from interactions among uh, physical, chemical, and biological factors. And the size of the ecosystem is uh, uh, arbitrary. So a bag of grain, if, when you are doing the analysis and under, trying to understand the causes of a spoilage, a bag of grain could be an uh, ecosystem or a silo, or you can look at the multiple uh, silos together. So like at an elevator, when you drive around, you see country elevator, you can analyze the country elevator as an ecosystem, or you can look at the whole grain handling system of a nation as an ecosystem and do that analysis, try to understand what's, uh, what's happening. Uh, so from a, uh, again, coming to a silos perspective, so you have the grain, which can be infested by insects, mites, uh, uh, bacteria, molds. It is affected by the surrounding weather parameters of the surroundings. So whether it's the relative humidity of the air, the temperature, uh, precipitation, uh, solar radiation and the wind, uh, and how that affected the solar radiation naturally would add the heat to the system. Uh, wind velocity would have effect on, it changes the heat transfer and how the heat from the surface is removed uh, to the surroundings, so that's where the convection comes into play. Precipitation theoretically should not affect, if the system is designed properly, then precipitation should not be affecting the quality of the grain because the moisture should not be getting into the system. Uh, but surprisingly, and I'm sure in Lethbridge it probably even happened, would happen more than even Manitoba, the little openings which, which are uh, when you close the, uh, close the uh, loading hole or the manhole on the, on the bins, uh, and the, the little openings, because of the swirling of the wind, the snow gets into the bins, uh, and precipitation does get in. So again, some, something as simple as making sure that when you are closing that door, have a foam around it, and then have a good latch would avoid that. Uh, and then sometimes that can cause significant loss. And the, the, the example I was giving of the farmer, that was what started the uh, spoilage, and then uh, spread into the whole bin, as an example. So the, uh, so the precipitation, I think, if we properly design the system, can be eliminated. But then we need to look at the effect of the other factors on the, how the grain is spoiled. So the important factors then are the uh, abiotic factors are temperature, moisture content, uh, gaseous concentration inside the, inside the bin, and the characteristic of the grain itself, because canola would behave differently than barley or wheat would behave. So the characteristic of the grain play a role. Uh, the biotic parameters are the microorganisms, insects, mites, uh, rodents, and birds, uh, and the grain itself is a biological material, so that's also a biological system. Uh, the one comment on the rodents and birds, and again, if you design the system properly, there is no reason why rodents would get in uh, into, the, into the storage structure. Uh, and similarly, birds could be eliminated. But if you don't design properly, you have a huge rodent infestation in the grain mass or the bird infestation. And then the, you can imagine the cross-contamination, the, the feces of the, of the vertebrates are a part of the grain. And again, we certainly use a lot of cleaning technology to clean uh, and prepare uh, before the foods get prepared. But uh, some of the feces and these are almost same size as the grain and they dig that ground as part of the system. So you do affect the quality of the, quality of the, uh, of the product. 
Uh, but these things can be easily, easily eliminated if the proper design is done. Uh, and the other, other factor which affects is the geographical location and grand structure. And here, geographical location comes into play is the weather parameters, which are, are interacting with the storage system. Grand structure is, uh, again, and there are two main kind used in Canada, the, the, the galvanized steel bin, which is the uh, you see on the farm, and then the two in the middle are the white welded steel bins. Uh, and then depending on, uh, and I would say more and more farmers are now buying it, is the welded steel bins, and that's because uh, our farmer uh, population is aging, and it's much easier to em clean uh, and empty the uh, hopper bottom bins uh, than the uh, flat bottom bins. Uh, it does require a lot of muscle power uh, towards the, about the bottom one meter when the your auger system cannot remove all that grain. So I think more and more are, uh, uh, are that. And then again, that structure then affect the, how the grain would uh, interact with the environment. So that uh, plays a role. But the two parameters which are the most important in the grain quality uh, and grain storage are the temperature and the moisture content of the grain, or moisture content of the grain is in equilibrium with the relative humidity of the air. So you can say the relative humidity and the temperature uh, from an air perspective or the moisture content and temperature from the grain perspective. Uh, so what this graph is basically showing is that as the temperature increases, uh, going from uh, left to right and the moisture increasing from top to bottom, there is an area where we have a safe storage zone where you can store the grain for one, two, or I would say even up to three years if you are in that safe storage uh, zone. Uh, and as the, either of those two parameters increase, you move then to the uh, uh, low risk of spoilage, medium risk of spoilage, or high risk of spoilage. So you can imagine in some of the, some parts of the world, the temperature, uh, controlling the temperature becomes a lot more expensive than in Canada. We are naturally blessed with the low temperatures and we can manage our grain certainly that much better, but the moisture can be a problem in the Canadian context, uh, depending on the year of the harvest. Uh, we are harvesting wet grain, and we cannot dry that in time, and then we put in this storage, we get uh, heavy spoilage from the microflora, or fungal, fungal in, uh, spoilage. And depending on the, how bad the fungal inf infection is, it could even have the mycotoxins produced in the grain, and that mycotoxin, when the, uh, consume, consumed by either humans or animals, then digestive system uh, is affected. Uh, so this is the general graph, which uh, would apply, the concept applies to any grain, but uh, our group has done a lot of work on developing the actual graphs for different uh, grains. So like this is an example of the graph, uh, uh, graph for the wheat. Uh, so if you, uh, the temperature you were expecting to be around, say, uh, 30 degrees centigrade for the grain. Uh, you can see even bringing down to 10 or 12 percent moisture content would not be uh, creating a safe storage environment. Uh, so in that case, uh, the chillers could be used or you can use the ambient air. The uh, certain low temperatures uh, are uh, certain in Canada are accessible for most of the year and you can use the ambient air through the grain to cool it down and bring it the temperature to the low temperature. Uh, and the similar graphs, uh, they change, so the numbers that, uh, the, the, uh, uh, are the same on the graph for different grains, but the, where that uh, uh, safe storage line is sifts with the different type of grains. So basically what we are looking then is that what is causing the spoilage is the interaction where the grain is the host. Uh, it could be mold and or insects, uh, which are uh, uh, present in there, the biological agents and the environment, interaction of the environment is what it's causing this spoilage. So as uh, designers of the systems, uh, engineers uh, do a lot of designing and a lot of farmers uh, are very creative and their own designers and they do their own design. So what they need to do is they need to understand this interaction and then try to manipulate the physical environment in a way that you don't create a little environment for the biological uh, uh, system. And that's how you increase the safe storage life. So looking at the eco, uh, ecosystem, uh, the, uh, so I have showed you that the, the, what is in the yellow there is what's caused from the geographical location. So that's the yellow, so the temperature, humidity, relative air, solar radiation, all that. 
But then there are transfer mechanisms happening within the grain. So there is a heat uh, transfer. So if there are temperature gradients in the grain mass, the, there would be a heat transfer in there. And then also heat transfer exchange occurring with the outside, uh, depending on the temperature differences. There is a gas transfer. So uh, when the grain is spoils, uh, it produces uh, moisture, heat, and carbon dioxide. And those gases move. And, and also it produces uh, off odors. So the volatiles are produced, and they also move inside the grain. So the gases, gases do get transferred, uh, distributed in the grain. The moisture is another one which distributes. So if you have a high moisture grain and a low moisture uh, grain in the different parts of the bin, moisture would try to equilibrate and would move, and the diffusion uh, pattern happens. Uh, our group uh, actually also showed that the insects, uh, individual insects, almost behave like a gas molecule, and they move randomly in the grain. Uh, and, uh, and you can model them uh, same way as you would model the gas, uh, gas transfer, as an example. Uh, and then, so, so the transfer models basically are then, uh, again, uh, you can represent those, uh, that movement of these gases, heat, uh, moisture, and the insects using partial differential equation in mathematical terms. So you basically have four simultaneous partial differential equations you have to solve to understand what's happening in the grain mass. And then when you solve those models, what you get is the gas concentration uh, at every point in the bin, or the temperature, or the moisture content, or the insect number at any point uh, every, anywhere in the bin. Uh, now keeping in mind that when you have the uh, biological, like insects in different part of the grain, or the moisture, uh, uh, high moisture grain, would produce, uh, would continue to produce the uh, gas, energy, and water. So that's why there's a back, uh, back flow. So it becomes a quite a complex mathematical uh, problem. But at the same time, if, if you solve these mathematical equations, you can get a pretty good idea where the uh, insect would be. So if you're designing a sampling protocol, and you know that the, in a, this particular situation, the insect would be congregating in this area, then that's where you need to sample so that you can detect the insect. Similarly, if there is a mold growth would occur, so you know is it occurring in the, at the top of the bin or the bottom of the bin. So models can help you decide what that location of that sampling would be. Mathematical models can also help you decide is, what, size, what kind of resolution you need for the sensor so, so you can detect. So if the CO2 uh, is 0.03 or 400 ppm in the environment, and in the grain mass, if it is 600 ppm, does that, that, that mean something is happening in the grain mass? It should be 400 ppm. So, uh, so what is that level of resolution required for the sensors to be able to detect the spoilers? So those are the kind of things mathematical models can do. And then mathematical models also give you a tool which uh, allow you to ask what happens if questions. So you can uh, design different systems. You can change the airflow rates uh, for the aeration, uh, and then answer a lot of those questions. Uh, because you try to do that experimentally would be impossible. So mathematical models then become a very good design tool to answer those what happens if questions. Uh, so why then we do the drying? So there are main reasons for drying of the grain are to extend the shelf life of the grain because high, mo high moisture grain spoils uh, faster. It prevents microbial growth and slows uh, enzymatic changes, uh, reduces grain mass, uh, and it facilitates in transportation uh, and handling. Uh, and the, again, the, uh, we are not then moving the water around. If you have a high moisture grain, then you are basically shipping the water around, which is not... Uh, and good for uh, storing the grain anyway. And there are many technologies which are used for uh, drying the grain. Um, they all would fall in the, what I would say the category of the forced ventilation. So the air of some type is forced through the grain to basically create, uh, remove the moisture, and also equilibrate the temperature. So that's where the aeration comes into. There are other technologies, so like microwave energy, uh, infrared, a lot of those are, I would say, are not used for grain, but they certainly are used for high value food product, drying of the high value food product. So they are not used for drying of the grain because of just the uh, commodity uh, being in, uh, uh, not very high price uh, and the cost of those technologies uh, is, is uh, expensive. So all of these uh, would f f fit under the single uh, term, force ventilation technologies. The aeration is used mainly for 
making the moisture and the temperature in the grain mass uh, 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 uniform. And the reason you want uniform moisture is so like in the temperature, if there is a temperature gradient, then the warm air would rise and cool, cool air would uh, settle. So you would have the air uh, move downward in the cool area and rise in the top area. So while it's moving down, it can pick up the moisture from the grain, rise it in the, in the warm area. And then if the top surface is cooler, for example, moisture can condense there. So the moisture migration happens because of temperature gradient and you want to avoid those. Uh, chilled aeration, as I said, uh, would be certainly needed in the warmer climates. Uh, and it's a very cost effective, although people think that uh, there is not air conditioning for people, why we want to have air conditioner for the, for the grain. Uh, uh, but you can have a one single chilling, chilling unit can chill the grain in multiple bins. Like, and the chilling itself, or the cooling of the grain, itself takes about 24 hours. So one unit, you cool it for 24 hours, move to another bin, and you can cool another bin. And once you have cooled the grain, grain is the best insulator. Uh, the, it uh, does not warm up that quickly. Uh, only the ambient temperature changes only affect about six inch along the surface, uh, along the peri uh, periphery. So the rest of the grain stays chilled for a long time. So, so you might have to do another uh, chilling run, maybe another three months or four months time frame. So that uh, kind of thing. The natural air drying and ambient, near ambient air drying are the terms which are used when you take the ambient air uh, at, uh, and then uh, circulate that uh, or force that through the grain to remove the moisture. Uh, and uh, depending on the amount of flow rate and depending on the initial moisture content, harvest date, uh, you would be able to predict how long it would take to dry the grain. And near ambient and natural air drying are used synonym, synonymously, but there is a slight difference in the near ambient drying when you're bringing the air over the fan, it picks up the frictional energy. So it increases the temperature of the air by two or three degrees centigrade. So that's why it's referred to as a near ambient, uh, whereas natural is just the ambient air and you are not uh, doing that. So if you were sucking the air, for example, you would not be adding that two or three degrees centigrade uh, as an example. Uh, low temperature drying is when you are trying to add maybe five to 10 degrees centigrade. That could be done with the propane or natural gas or electric. Uh, electricity, uh, so then you are increasing the air temperature by five to 10 degrees, then it's a low temperature drying. And if you are increasing that air temperature uh, to anywhere from uh, 50 to 200 degrees centigrade, then you are dealing with a high temperature drying. And naturally, depending on the moisture you would need, uh, need uh, depending on the moisture of the grain, you would have to decide which drying method would work uh, because uh, ambient air drying or natural air drying or low temperature drying cannot dry if the grain was too wet. You have to use then high temperature dry. And the dry aeration or combination drying is the term when you would do the high temperature. Uh, one uh, uh, problem with high temperature drying is because you are exposing the grain to a, such a high temperature difference, so thermal stresses get created and it can develop cracks. And some co uh, grains are very prone to developing stress cracks. So like rice uh, would uh, uh, develop those cracks, corn, uh, and many pulses uh, develop uh, those cracks. So you want to avoid that. So in that case, what is done that using the high temperature dryer, you would reduce the moisture uh, a small amount and then use the uh, ambient air to reduce the uh, another two or three percentage moisture. And that reduces the stress cracks and gives you better quality grain. So that's why the dry air isn't, but now, Keeping in mind, now you, have, you need double the infrastructure because you need high temperature dryer and also need the ambient air dryer. Uh, now the hot air dryers, uh, there are many different types. Uh, they could be batch, recirculating, continuous flow. Continuous flow could be cross uh, or concurrent. That means the air is moving in the opposing direction or the same direction or in a perpendicular to the grain or the mixed flow dryer. And I think uh, at, on the farm, uh, the, uh, the one the, which is installed there, dryer is the mixed flow dryer. And again, it take advantage of the, all the flow mechanisms. Uh, and the batch type, they could be either on floor or roof type, and that's in the bins. So you structure, create the structure right in the bin uh, to do the, uh, do the drying. Uh, but the, uh, so the next few slides, I just want to give you the what has been done in this area and the research. So in the high temperature drying, what's in the black uh, on the main slide is the, what we know today or what has been done. 
uh, and the blue are the kind of things which still needs to be done and uh, attention need to be paid. So, for example, on high temperature dryers and associated control strategies, end use and temperature relationship uh, have been developed for not all crops, but some of the crops. Uh, and the major focus certainly has been on corn and soya. Uh, and this is uh, uh, around, the, like I'm talking about the research done around the globe. Uh, and there are uh, mainly temperature-based controls are used uh, mm, to control the uh, drying process. Uh, and there's a potential for a stress crack development. And uh, so the, what uh, temperature differences cause the stress crack, so some understanding for some of the crops is there. And uh, what still needs to be done uh, is that we need to design the dryers which dry the grain uniformly. Uh, because if you have uh, part of the grain is over dried, part is under dried, and if it is not better, uh, well mixed, then the spoilage would start in the wet grain. Uh, it would, uh, because the mo movement of the moisture from grain kernels to grain kernels is a slow process, and it does not come to equilibrium very fast. Uh, so you, uh, if it, there is a gradient in that uh, drying process, that needs to be mixed uh, before it goes into the storage, the storage bin. So, but you can design better system and mixed flow uh, dryers certainly try to do that, but there are other ways you can uh, create uniformity of drying. Uh, start using moisture-based control because it's the moisture you are trying to control, not the temperature of the grain. Uh, so the moisture-based controls need to be developed. Uh, and the effect on the grain quality, uh, as I said, only limited uh, work has been done on major crops, but many, many crops, particularly specialty crops, pulses, not much work has been done yet. Uh, on the coming then to the uh, forced air uh, ventilation in the, uh, in the ambient, uh, using the ambient air or low, uh, low temperature drying. And the typical system looks like basically you have a fan, a transition from fan to the bin, uh, the plenum underneath uh, which has a perforated floor, and you force the air in the vertical direction, uh, vertically, and then that air, air then removes the moisture or uh, uh, equilibrates the temperature. So the system basically looks something like that. Uh, where you have a perforated floor, and then when you are forcing that air, uh, you, are, uh, you have a dried grain at the bottom. Mm, if you are forcing up, if it was uh, pulling down, it would uh, reverse the order. Then you have drying front, which is moving through, and then wet grain on the top. Uh, now, uh, not every bin, but some bins certainly have the sensors, uh, sensor cables. Uh, now, uh, every bin would not have all of the sensors. Some might only have a temperature cable. Some might have a temperature or moisture cable. Some might have uh, one of the cables and the insectors to detect the uh, activity of the insects. Uh, there certainly could be the sensors to look at the head space uh, temperature and uh, relative humidity and impact of that on the quality uh, and the weather station local, uh, available. Again, you don't need a weather station on every bin, but if there are multiple bins in the area, you, one weather station would give you the data needed to do the under, uh, modeling and design of the system. So, uh, so in the drying process, when you are for doing that kind of drying, what this basically is showing you is the, the uh, as you keep forcing the air, and as the time increases, the bottom layer dries first, and so you can see the moisture patterns, and the top layer still stays quite uh, at a high moisture. And the purpose of the forcing that ambient air is that the drying should occur uh, without the spoilage of the top layer. Because if the top, top layer is at high moisture even during, during that process, so you want to make sure that your drying front moves to the top layer before the spoilage uh, occurs. So, so that's, the, that's the goal. Uh, now, the, uh, most of the system uh, in uh, not only Canada, I would say around the globe, have been forcing the air uh, in a vertical direction. Uh, the challenge with that vertical direct forcing is that when you increase the grain depth, it increases the resistance which the fan has to overcome. And, uh, and those of you who know of the fans, if you increase that resistance, the amount of airflow which comes out of the fan decreases. And uh, you can almost just a, a steep decrease. Uh, so if you design a system for, say, two meter de depth, it would work fine. But if you put four meter, the same system would not work, it would not dry, dry the grain or would not remove the moisture and would not complete the drying in that time period. So uh, we had, uh, for about uh, quite significant time, we have, I've been talking about that, do we, why don't we design forcing the air in a horizontal direction? Uh, and, 
and the and the advantage of that is then the the distance between the uh, between the duct and the wall stays constant does not matter how much grain you fill so the pressure difference does not change uh, and then it the, the air moves uh, uh, equally in all directions so the drying is uh, more uniform uh, whereas in the uh, vertical forcing you have an over dried grain at the bottom and under dried at the top and it still requires that mixing uh, so after a lot of uh, research and uh, I would say a lot of convincing, uh, talking to people, uh, convincing uh, m uh, manufacturers, talking to farmers, and now horizontal drying systems are available. So this is an example of GATCO uh, 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 manufacturing which now uh, markets the horizontal system. Um, but in this case the air is introduced uh, uh, from at the wall and then collected in the center and discharged. The, the, the one we developed uh, in the lab was putting the air in the center and discharging on the walls. But the concept is the same. Uh, and now the horizontal air flow has become popular, but it's still not as popular as the still the vertical drying systems are, are being used. Mm, but it certainly provides the more energy efficient drying and uniform drying and uh, mm, uh, and uh, and then the depth, uh, you can control the grain depth much more uh, flexibly. There are many control strategies for the forced air ventilation system. So uh, I'm, uh, basically, so you can r let the fan run continuously. And that used to be the recommendation. If you know nothing, let the fan run continuously. And, uh, and then farmers were doing that. Um, but then uh, you can have the fan on in daytime or nighttime. Uh, you can do based on a time control uh, that uh, have a fan on for six hours uh, uh, and uh, not on for another six hours. You can do a thermostat control based on the temperature, humidity stat, uh, temperature difference, delta T between the outside and the inside. Uh, you can do delta RH similarly. You can do based on a natural uh, air drying system, which is the EMC really trying to manipulate the EMC or you can use the uh, variable uh, fan uh, uh, heat control uh, systems. And these controllers, again, if you try to do the experiments, would take a long time uh, because we just cannot, we would run out of the resources to set up all these uh, possible experiments so you can do mathematical models. And this is the one uh, Chandra and I did a few years ago where we looked at the simulation mathematical model. And this one, basically what you are looking at is this graph is summarizing that you are looking at the on the top and the different colors are basically indicating the different harvest date of the grain. Uh, the, the three sections of the graph are for the, if the initial moisture content was 20% versus 18% versus 16%. Uh, and the, what you have then is on the vertical axis is the moisture content uh, on the left hand side. Right hand side is the, the scale for the, uh, the uh, uh, percentage uh, of the drawing. But what you see here is basically is that if you look at the uh, different and the, and, the, and the horizontal axis are the control strategy, whether fan is on continuously or for the day, uh, daytime, nighttime, uh, or variable control. And as you can see, is uh, that 16% moisture content, initial moisture content, there is a lot more uniformity in drying. 20%, that's not the case. Um, closer to go to the, for example, uh, uh, yellow is the October 1 harvest versus the August 20th harvest. There is a lot more drying potential in the air if you harvest in early in, in August, but not in October, that drying is not occurring. Uh, but under any of these situations, certainly the EMC or the variable control gives you a lot more uniformity of drying. Uh, you can also superimpose on that the energy consumption. Uh, so, so mathematical models can help you design or understand uh, uh, given the harvest date, given the moisture content and type of the grain would also have an impact, uh, then what uh, amount of air flow is needed. And then you need to match the air flow with the size of the bin or the size, grain depth so that the static pressure is properly meeting that requirement. So in the aeration, chilled aeration or ambient air in dying area, the guidelines for wheat, corn and canola certainly have been developed and are available. Uh, there, but unfortunately, the guidelines are only available under temperate and maritime climates. Uh, unfortunately, not much work has been done on the tropical, uh, tropical climates. And uh, typically, the controls are still limited to uh, on-off temperature and humidity-based control. But the EMC, equilibrium moisture content-based or variable uh, heat control systems are still not being used. 
So there certainly is a need for developing moisture-based controls, guidelines for remaining greens and climates, uh, chill aeration uh, work need to be done, uh, low temperature drying, and the uh, different uh, uh, sensor controls need to be developed. And dry aeration system, uh, as I said, uh, because it's a combination drying, it reduces the stress crack, so certainly that's well established, it increases the drying capacity, uh, and focus has been mainly on corn, soybean, and wheat. So uh, like canola is a very ma major crop in Canada, very little work has been done uh, for canola, for example. Uh, and so an integration with chilled aeration, it uh, certainly can be done even in, for Canadian climates. Uh, quality comparison with the hot air drying, with the combination drying need to be done for many crops. And the moisture based uh, controls as uh, similar to the uh, ambient air drying need to be developed. Uh, so uh, similar technologies. Uh, another aspect is that uh, I, I was saying that we need to have high quality grains to produce high quality products, so we need to have a me mechanisms to monitor the quality of the grain. Uh, so what is known in the quality monitoring area, certainly the physical properties of most grain types are known, uh, chemical constituents are known, uh, and uh, for quality monitoring temperature and RS sensors are being used, uh, and the technology is there, they, they can be used if people want to use them. And then certainly the, some of the machine vision tools have been developed to assess the quality, whether it's optical imaging, thermal imaging, uh, soft x-ray, uh, particularly detecting insects, for example, internal feeding insects, uh, soft x-rays have been used uh, and, and are, uh, are being used, and multi-spectral and hyperspectral imaging techniques. Um, but what need to be done? A lot more need to be done on quality monitoring. So there need to be protocols for collecting representative samples because you cannot uh, look at every kernel. Uh, the commodity is uh, such a large quantity, so you, your sample has, what, what you are analyzing is a very small portion of that, uh, that grain mass. So your sample has to be representative. We need to develop right protocol that how we collect the representative sample. Uh, moisture, odor, insect, uh, and, uh, uh, and the wireless sensors uh, need to be developed. Real-time monitoring for Andy's quality still is not there. Uh, people are doing some research. Quick monitoring for mycotoxins. Uh, and especially uh, when you're marketing the grain, many importing countries nowadays put a requirement of certain level of the mycotoxins in the grain. And sometimes, and unfortunately, it's used as a trade barrier. Uh, but sometimes it's, there's a legitimate concern uh, because mycotoxins do affect the health of the people and the animals. Uh, a role of nano sensors can be looked at, automation of the grain car unloading, uh, binning and uh, shipping, uh, assisted gra uh, uh, grain grading. So technology is, is still not integrated. Most of the grain grading is still done by human inspectors. And you know uh, the fatigue issues, uh, depending on the time of the day somebody's performing, how, uh, what kind of party they had night before could have impact on what they are going to predict the next day. So there are a lot of issues. And so I think certainly the technology uh, can be, at least if not replace the human inspector, can be used uh, assisting them uh, for moving that forward. And automated uh, detection of the grain damages and the role of AI, uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning methods uh, need to be explored. Uh, and there are only recently some people have started uh, uh, using that technology in the grain quality monitoring and prediction of the grain quality. There are implications of climate change uh, on the food security. So uh, certainly uh, we have all by now can appreciate that it has a potential to increase the atmosphere carbon dioxide, which could be beneficial uh, in terms of the uh, crop yield. Uh, that's the one uh, silver lining on the, in the climate change that it can potentially increase the yield uh, uh, from the same uh, crop area. Uh, uh, global temperature increases, there's an increase in evapotranspiration, so more moisture, uh, more water would be required for growing crops, increase in the severity and frequency of weather events, uh, and that can have a huge impact uh, on certainly uh, a food production system, uh, impact on the quantity and quality of water, increase in sea level and impact on coastal areas, uh, as ocean acidification and increase in salinity of coastal areas. So all of these factors, I think now, I would say most public recognize that the, these, these things are happening. But what this uh, means for grain uh, preservation, so effect on the grain preservation, so increased temperature, uh, which global warming is causing, will increase the insect populations in stored grain. Because uh, they, the, the, the 
higher the temperature, now again, if it's too high temperature, they can be killed. But at higher temperature, their multiplication rate is much higher, or their generation for completing their life cycle is shorter. So more generation of insect can, can be developed. Uh, population of dynas, dynamics of insect is species dependent, so some insect would behave differently. So we have to almost create a whole new research program to try to, un try to understand what impact it would have on different species in the grain uh, insects, the grain insects, uh, because of the global warming. Uh, another silver lining could be is the drying may be sooner because if you have warmer temperatures, you can complete the drying sooner, but that advantage uh, may not last very long uh, because of the severe weather events uh, where there's large fluctuation. Uh, so the quality and determinants of the grains, uh, both the extrinsic and intrinsic features of the grain, quality climate change would affect many quality parameters and possibly requiring adjustment to the grading practices, uh, processing and consumer preferences. Uh, so that uh, would increase the cost of producing the, uh, the processed foods, but also managing the stored grains. Uh, implication on insects themselves, uh, the chances are that the, from an ecological perspective, the, the changes in the abundance of insects. There is also possibility of the distribution that the insects which are in the warmer climates now, so like for, say, say south, and they would move more to the northern part, uh, northern part. so the, the area which never used to see insect infestation would start seeing insect infestation. Uh, and increased feeding and sounds, uh, 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 so certainly the food spoilage would increase uh, with that uh, and uh, their, with their increased metabolic activity. Uh, implication, other insects are the favorable growth and development conditions for insect, changes in geographical distribution, uh, increased overwintering, because one or two degrees centigrade would give them enough uh, temp warm temperature that they would then hide in that space in the grain mass and survive, uh, even the Canadian uh, harsh winters uh, and prairie harsh winters, uh, increase in population growth, increase in number of generations, extension of development season, and changes in inter-specific uh, specifications. Implications for drying, this is increased temperature, as I said, increase the grain drying uh, rate uh, at the near ambient, and maybe faster. Uh, existing fan may be able to dry or cool more grain. Uh, increase in the harvest moisture and RH may negate this effect because of the weather events, the severe weather events. If, that, if the high moisture, we can't uh, harvest uh, dry grain or close to dry grain, then we can't do the drying with the near ambient uh, temperature. Uh, right sizing of the fan depends on the initial moisture content, harvest date, grain type, depth of grain. Uh, to be dried and uh, air introduction system. So the system design would have to be rethought with the global warming. Uh, and the fumigation may be more effective because higher temperature, and then when the grain is being fumigated, uh, the insect respiration rate or act biological activity is higher, so they do die faster at higher temperature. So that could be possible. Uh, potential resource needs in the grain storage drying, certainly better drying systems are needed to reduce the moisture with less energy and more uniform drying. Continuous monitoring system for grain conditions need to be developed. Uh, as I said, temperature and RS are being used, but there is a need for moist, uh, microwave imaging, and there is a work being done capturing and counting insects, so electronic counting and mathematical models as in, uh, management tools. Uh, automated grain quality monitoring need to be done, uh, and automation in grain handling operations, whether it's rail car content analysis, uh, binning and blending decisions, uh, automation, in determining degrading factor and predicting end use characteristics. And a lot of that requires then multidisciplinary approach. So the days are gone that um, one discipline can solve all these problems so because of the complexity. So we have to start encouraging a lot more teams working together to solving some of these issues. And certainly more experiment work is needed under ex uh, laboratory conditions. Proper sampling and monitoring protocols need to be developed and capacity building through education and training, and that's where uh, universities and colleges can play a major role. And at the same time, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the provincial government have gotten rid of their extension divisions in most, pl most places, and uh, other than US, uh, uh, and even, even in US, I think they keep re decreasing the amount, number of people who are doing the extension. Uh, but somehow that information has to be still communicated to the, uh, to the user community uh, so I think dissemination of the research to the people uh, uh, need to be prioritized and maybe it would fall on the post-secondary institutions to do that uh, and then engage the user community in the research program, not more. 
So with that, I want to thank uh, certainly the University of Manitoba for giving me a wonderful place to do research uh, and uh, giving me a lot of freedom to do uh, all sort of research in the grain storage, grain drying, grain handling areas, uh, grain storage researches, uh, not only in Manitoba, around the globe, because uh, research uh, build on each other's uh, knowledge base and uh, it uh, grows from there and the collaborators uh, um, my own research, I have had collaborators, I, I'm a biosystem engineer, but I have always worked very closely with entomologists, uh, with chemists, uh, with the electrical engineers, uh, with agriculture economists, so, so we need to uh, take that, uh, so I certainly thank them. Graduate students who, uh, as you know, in uh, every system, graduate students are the heart of the uh, whole research enterprise. And, uh, and I would say heart and engine, if we want engine terminology. And I have been very fortunate to have excellent graduate students who continue to uh, contribute it. And the funding, the research would not happen without funding, so many funding organizations at the federal level, provincial level, or industry has been critical, and I certainly acknowledge their contribution. That, uh, I don't know how much.